With a vision towards the development of innovative technological advancement and creative human capital, University Technology Malaysia UTM, has established a global reputation for avant-garde education and cutting-edge research. Governed by the same principles and values of its main campus in Johor, the postgraduate campus in Kuala Lumpur, known as UTMKL, is the crown jewel of national lifelong learning. By taking advantage of its strategic location in the heart of Malaysia's capital city, UTMKL offers industry-driven graduate programs specifically designed to suit the busy urban lives of the local community. As global development gears up to its apical pace, the demand for higher education soars to its peak. In recent years, UTMKL's student enrollment has increased exponentially. Realizing the influx, UTM Board of Directors had concluded that there is a need for a new and holistic student accommodation complex that shall include all amenities that will cater to the needs of a contemporary student. And in 2013, after a comprehensive feasibility study and meticulous designing and planning, the building contract was awarded to Ahmad Zaki Sindrian Berhad, AZSB, with an outstanding value of 171.5 million ringgit. The complex, which has been certified by Green Building Index, GBI Malaysia, was idealized by the former UTM Vice Chancellor, Professor Datuk Sri Engineer Dr. Zaini Ujang, and was materialized by his successor, Professor Datuk Dr. Wahid Omar. Both Vice Chancellors have envisioned that the complex will not be just a mere lodging for students, but must serve to contribute to the economic and commercial activities of the local community. Above all, the complex must be self-sufficient, without having to depend on government funds in order to sustain its daily operations. In an area of 192,000 square meters, this avant-garde building complex was planned to consist of student accommodation, management office, maintenance office, commercial area, surau, alfresco dining outlets, swimming pool, wading pool and gymnasium. In the initial drawing plan, the student accommodation complex will include four blocks, of which Block 1 with 150 units of two-bedroom apartments, Block 2 with 50 units of three-bedroom apartments, Block 3 with 118 units of studio apartments, and Block 4 with 182 units of studio apartments. Saya kalau nak tanya background saya Sekarang ni saya NCUTM lah Dah masuk tahun yang ke-7 And uh, sebelum ni saya adalah pensyarah uh, Di Fakulti Kerjuran Awam Sekarang ni dah jadi sekolah lah Kita dah transform some of the faculty ni Pengalaman dan juga Apa nama Kepakaran lah Bersama dengan tim sedia ada ketika itu Jadi sehinggalah uh, ketika itu juga zaman Ketika Menteri Datuk Seri Zaini menjadi Nat Chancellor Dah mula memikirkan tentang peluang-peluang uh, Menyediakan fasiliti kepada pelajar Melalui keedah yang berlainan Jadi bila kita duduk dengan lembaga lembaga pengarah ni Mereka ni orang-orang yang berpengalaman Jadi melihat kepada keperluan kami dan juga peluang Peluangnya ialah kita ada tanah yang sangat bernilai di Kuala Lumpur Dan kita juga sebenarnya merancang untuk membangunkan kampus Kuala Lumpur Jadi keperluan ini memang ada Peluang pun ada Ketika itu juga zaman Ketika Menteri Datuk Seri Zainim dan Dinat Chancellor Dah mula memikirkan tentang peluang-peluang uh, Menyediakan fasiliti kepada pelajar Melalui keedah yang berlainan Sehinggalah uh, ada lembaga pengarah yang mencadangkan Kenapa kita tak menggunakan model uh, Iaitu kita mengambil pinjaman Kita engage kontraktor Kontraktor bina kita operate sendiri uh, Itu yang jadi sekarang kita ambil pinjaman daripada EPF 180 juta kita buka kepada selective tendering kita nilaikan setiap kontraktor dan kita laksanakan projek ni secara design and build eh, bila buka LP datanglah balik bila kita bernilai dari segi kos construction 
dari segi desain sebenarnya desain kita dah ada desain kita, kita desain sendiri kita dah engage arkitek untuk disebut sebab RFP itu sama keperluan kita kan kita dah engage konsultan arkitek buat satu desain lepas kita buka untuk kontraktor masuk berdasarkan kaedah desain and build proses memastikan konsultasi mengikut jadual apa? kita bekerja dalam orang kata apa constraint budget yang sangat ketat kita tak boleh nak apa orang kata apa overrun the cost kita tak boleh nak terlalu panjang EOT kita juga berdepan dengan keperluan apa DBKL kan yang kita juga menghadapi cabaran daripada tenant jiran-jiran kita itu antara cabaran masa construction it cannot fail yes that is the right word sebenarnya dan bukan ketika construction sekarang ni pun kalau saya kata reflect sekarang punya kita punya business ni we cannot fail because commitment kita ialah loan sebanyak 180 juta loan ni kita bayar melalui ikuti hasil tapi Alhamdulillah rezeki mungkin saya letakkan ini sebagai rezeki UTM lah di mana bila projek ini siap nampak gayanya bisnesnya bagus hotel kita di disub kepada dua operators dan kita ada mall bawah tu dan mall ni sekarang ni dah fully occupied yang masuk pula nama-nama yang hebat lah dan dari segi demand yang Alhamdulillah sangat bagus dan juga memberi orang kata apa keselesaan yang sangat bagus kepada pelajar yang mampu lah sebab yang tak mampu ada tempat dia yang kurang mampu lah eh tapi yang mampu memang mereka enjoy duduk di situ sebab apa ada swimming pool ada bowling ada kat situ juga kita boleh sewakan untuk event ada ballroom eh? ada restoran kan ada tempat baru ada hotel juga dia buat pula sediakan bilik-bilik yang boleh digunakan untuk workshop wow Alhamdulillah pada setengah orang dia kata wow macam mana UTM plan sebenarnya kita masa plan kita pun tak menyangka dia akan nampak meriah begitu tapi bila dah jadi ni kita rasa cukup sebab apa ini kita mengambil risk yang besar sehingga tim kita sangat bagus saya rasa one of the contribution kepada kejayaan ialah pengalaman yang kita dah bina sebelum ni dengan pengalaman kami bila kami compare dengan projek-projek yang kami buat dalam PK9 uh, dia punya cost saving tu a lot sangat signifikan based on per square foot eh, kita bina kita compare dengan satu lagi bangunan di KL tu kita bina residency ni at a 40% lower per square foot which is very 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 significant bayangkan saya bayangkan ini kalau lah kita boleh ubah orang kata apa persekitaran ekosistem apa ni construction industry berdasarkan kepada tadi bayangkan berapa banyak kita boleh dan kita letakkan satu vision eh, kepada mereka bahawa ini komitmen kita ini tanggungjawab kita projek ni projek kita kita ada komitmen kena bayar hutang kita ada komitmen kena siapkan projek ini jadi ada beberapa key person dalam tu yang memahami termasuklah projek director tadi dan saya sebut tadi juga kita ada team QS yang melihat kepada claim contractor melihat kepada self specification kita ada arkitek yang compare jadi kita very strict thus with the planning and all preliminary works prepared the effort to award a contractor is promptly done and almost immediately after the contract was awarded to AZSP the construction of UTM residency began in 2013 In the early state of the construction, the main thing that needed to be done is the soil investigation. In principle, the investigation is required to identify the type of soil within the construction area of which would be the basis to determine the depth of piling that would withstand the calculated building weight. Although there are not much high-risk activities being done during the period, the site strictly observed and adhered to all health safety and environment HSE regulations. The place is enclosed with hoardings and is guarded around the clock. A temporary site office is also built to station administrative staff and engineers. Whilst a set of team is focusing on the soil investigation, another team will focus on pile. At this stage, a series of fundamental pressure load tests will be done on the pile. Low tests on piles are typically done for 4 weeks or 28 days 
after the piles are casted. During the routine load test, the pressure load is measured to ensure that the pile is durable enough to withstand the predetermined building weight. This will be the crucial moment where AZSB engineers will need to meticulously decide whether or not a pile is able to hold. A pile will be considered as a working pile if it is able to hold a minimum of 50% of the final load. And to determine the safe load or allowable load or ultimate load bearing capacity of a pile, a load test called the initial test will be performed onto the fabricated piles. Essentially, this test is performed to confirm the design load calculations and to set up guidelines for setting up the limit of acceptance for the routine load test. Commonly, cantledge is referred to iron weights that are used as permanent ship ballast. In the construction industry, cantledge is a system of iron or concrete weights used in load testing, particularly applied to pile structure during a vertical load test. During the assembly, cranes and other mover vehicles and machines are needed to carry out the work. Evidently, the vertical load test is the most expensive and highly risky technique of performing a load test. However, the approach is the fastest and the most effective way of providing reaction for load testing piles in compression. A bore hole is essentially a narrow vertical shaft bored into the ground. Borehole drilling is the ground excavating action to attain such hole. Bored pile is a cylindrical body made of concrete that is reinforced with steel and is constructed inside a borehole. The typical method of fabricating a bored pile is by drilling a borehole to a specific depth, installing a series of steam cages inside the borehole and the hole is filled with a predetermined concrete mix. Bore piling is a common form of building foundation that provides support for structures. Board piles have the capability to transfer high structural load to layers of soil that have sufficient bearing capacity and suitable settlement characteristics. In this footage, AZSP engineers are making sure the base is secured and the piling has been fabricated with the correct procedure to ensure that the building will be erected solid as a rock. The casing used for the project is code P47, which is 1,500 mm in diameter. Casings are strong tubes and are normally made of steel. Segmental casing is used as a support for a board piling system, particularly at sites with deeper unstable soil conditions. It is deployed during the drilling stage and can be installed and extracted by using a drilling rig or an oscillator attached to a rig, service crane or power pack. If a joining is required, it will typically be done by welding or bolting. Thicker tubes which are made of stronger steel will need welding. As what can be seen here, a welding specialist is needed to connect the casings. Steel reinforcement cage or prefabricated cage plays a vital role in any concrete building construction. These pre-manufactured cages are mainly used to transmit the loads and stresses of a structure to a framework of columns and beams, of which in turn will transfer the loads to the foundation of the building. In most cases, a mesh-type reinforcement cage is the best option due to its strong design structure. These reinforcement cages must be free from rust as well as any heavy dirt or mud and must not be placed until they are fully inspected and approved. Reinforcement cages installed, as seen here, are satisfactorily rigid to ensure that they remain at the correct level during the lifting and placement of concrete and during the extraction of temporary lining tubes. Directly after the boring for the pile has been completed and after the approval to commence to the next step has been obtained, Concreting works must start forthwith and continue without interruption. All concrete for cast-in-place piles should be compacted to produce a dense homogeneous mass by a method endorsed by the project engineer. The high-grade concrete is generously poured into the borehole. 
The material and methods to fabricate the concrete piles are vigilantly observed and must be in accordance with the industry standard practices. The concrete for each pile needs to be obtained from the same source to ensure that the mix will have a comparable integrity. The contractor is required to ensure that the supply of concrete, either site mixed or ready mixed, is of sufficient quantity so that all piles are placed without any delay. All boreholes are concreted within the same day. In the event of rain, it is imperative for the contractor to secure all boreholes with waterproof covers to ensure all concrete-filled boreholes are retained from rain. Concrete can be transported using a variety of methods ranging from wheelbarrows, dumpers and ready-mix trucks to skips and pumps. An experienced engineer will always be standing by when the concrete is being placed. The person must have all suitable tools such as props, bolts and others ready in order to handle any dangerous situations. Throughout the construction, there are regular visits by the UTF board members to the site in order to obtain the current status updates and to ensure all work is done smoothly as what has been planned. There are also other visits by various UTM faculties for observation, monitoring and educational purposes. The site is being prepared for the Pile Driving Analyzer or PDA test. The PDA system is the most widely employed system for dynamic load testing and pile driving monitoring in the world. Also known as High Strain Dynamic Load Test, the capacity of several piles are assessed in a single day. The pile driving analyzer systems also evaluate shaft integrity, driving stresses and hammer energy when monitoring installation. PDA tests are performed during driving on pilot or production piles, taking advantage of the high strain impact provided by the driving hammer. Restrike PDA tests are often proposed if the driving hammer is no longer on location. In this case, a drop weight may be used to impact the pile. The PDA test provides information on the acceleration and strains inside a pile during driving operations. The test data reveals the pile driving stresses and compression, energy and the contribution of shock grinding and tow resistance to the load bearing capacity. Driving records are readily accessible to aid in optimizing the foundation, specifically via the exact selection of the last driving depth. Regulations from the local authority and the Department of Occupational Safety and Health or DOSH, D -O -S -H, requires that all contractors to observe a periodical mosquito fogging exercise at the construction site. As a responsible contractor, AZSP strictly adheres to the regulations at all times to ensure that any mosquito-borne diseases are curbed. As soon as the site has been carefully prepared as per approved work method statement of which includes the adherence to all HSE standards and regulations, the drilling is able to commence. The drilling is an intricate operation that requires a systematic configuration. A multitude of processors and a number of well-trained specialists are needed to perform this operation. AZSP engineers constantly work closely with all these experts on every aspect of the project whilst strictly adhering to all local authority requirements and regulations. The drilling process is continuously done during the approved working hours each day. It is rather unusual for work to be done on weekends and public holidays. A standard borehole depth is within the range of 30 to 50 meters. The diameter of the pile varies from 1 meter to 2.2 meters, depending on the calculated loads. The same range of borehole depth is excavated for this project. This is to ensure that the piles are able to bear the predetermined loads and stresses of the final structure. It is crucial that all reinforcement steel cages are to be positioned accurately. Otherwise, the strength and integrity of the structure may be significantly deteriorated. 
The concocted concrete mix is poured through a chute as seen here to make sure that the newly mixed concrete is placed from the bottom of the borehole. The technique will also ensure that muds and sludge are displaced out. A temporary casing is installed to prevent the ground beneath the working platform and the surrounding working area from collapsing. The installation of temporary casing is done using a vibro hammer guided by a crawler crane. This is the most effective method as it vibrates while the worker pushes down the temporary casing. Some advantages of vibratory hammers are that they are able to drive piles much quicker than other types of driving hammers to extract all piles out of the ground and they are relatively less noisy. The breaking down of concrete piles is an essential part of the construction process. A suitable pile breaking method will be identified and agreed by AZSB engineers of which will result to significant financial benefits and savings on the overall construction project. More importantly, it will reduce most health hazards related to this phase of work. When the pile installation work meets the project specifications and other industry requirements, the concrete of the head of the pile shall be cut off to a specific level. Special precautionary measures are strictly taken during the task to avoid shattering, which in turn will cause significant damage to the rest of the pile. Any cracked or defective concrete are to be cut away and the pile is to be repaired to proffer a perfectly full segment at the predetermined cut-off level. Formwork is the form and framing used to contain and shape wet concrete until it is self-supporting. Formwork includes the forms on or within which the concrete is poured and the frames and bracing which provides stability. The formwork serves as mold for concrete structural components unless such mold is provided by the soil or other structural components. It molds the placed fresh concrete which in this stage normally is viscous to the shape specified in the drawing. Formwork used in this construction project are designed, fabricated, erected, supported, braced and maintained so that they are able to support all vertical and horizontal loads that will be exerted. AZSB engineers precisely monitor all formwork installed to ensure that they are adequately strong and able to carry the loads produced by the concrete. As what can be seen here, the workers are placing and finishing the concrete including several other materials which are supported by the forms. From time to time, the site workers, including engineers, laborers and safety officers are required to attend a toolbox talk. The talk is an informal safety meeting that focuses on safety topics related to specific jobs such as workplace hazards and safe work practices. At this stage, the whole project is only at 15% completion. However, all piling works are 100% finished. Pile foundations are principally used to transfer loads from superstructures through weak, compressible strata or water onto stronger, more compact, less compressible and stiffer soil or rock at depth. They are typically used for large structures and in situations where soil is not suitable to prevent excessive settlement. The term socket piles or rock sockets refers to a technique that is used to embed a pile into solid rock. This can be necessary to utilize the full structural capacity of the piles for both compressive and tensile forces. It is a technique that is typically used for offshore applications such as drilling into a rocky seabed where the depth is shallow or there is sloping solid rock. The technique involves drilling into the rock layer to create a socket which is slightly larger than the pile. This creates a void around the outer edge of the pile which is filled with ultra high strength grout depending on the structural requirements. This socket in the rock provides the pile with stability by providing resistance against lateral loads and uplift forces. Concrete beams vary in their depths. The deeper the beam, the more the shear capacity is required. When the depth is not adequate, steel stirrups must be added to increase the shear capacity of the beam. 
These stirrups are usually one piece of steel that is bent into a rectangular shape. Often small diameter steel is used such as number 3 or number 4 rebar. The stirrups typically wraps around the bottom and top bars of the beams. RAs seen in the footage, which is dated September 2014. The project completion is at 20%. Excavation work is defined as the removal of earth, rock or other material in connection with construction or demolition works using tools, machineries or explosives to form an open face, hole or cavity. Excavation work includes any earthwork, trenching, cofferdam, caisson, well shaft, tunnel or underground working. Excavation of rock or soil is an important aspect of any construction or, in a larger sense, in any civil engineering project. The excavation techniques or the methods of excavation of rocks differ from those in soil. Methods of excavation can be classified according to their purpose, that is, whether the excavation is for foundations, slopes or underground openings. Excavations should be carried out as per the drawings define lengths and widths. Another important activity at the project site is the application of anti-termite. Reconstructional anti-termite treatment is a process in which soil treatment is applied to a building in early stages of its construction. The purpose of anti-termite treatment is to provide the building with a chemical barrier against subterranean termites. The treatment is a specialized job that calls for thorough knowledge of the chemicals, soils, types of termite to be dealt with and the environmental conditions in order to provide effective cure and lasting protection. Moreover, the treatment is stipulated in the specification, compliance as well as in the award contract. Another important activity at the project site is the application of anti-termite. Pre-constructional anti-termite treatment is a process in which soil treatment is applied to a building in early stages of its construction. The purpose of anti-termite treatment is to provide the building with a chemical barrier against subterranean termites. The treatment is a specialized job that calls for thorough knowledge of the chemicals, soils, types of termite to be dealt with and the environmental conditions in order to provide effective cure and lasting protection. Moreover, the treatment is stipulated in the specification, compliance as well as in the award contract. The foundation of the building in this project is expected to bear a considerable heavy load. The floor loadings are calculated to range from 450 to 1,500 kilograms per square meter and high quality materials and design are used to maximize the capacity bearings. Before any concrete work is carried out, it is important for AZRB engineers to check the levels of foundation first. For most projects, it is bound that excavated depths are slightly exceeding the plant deepness and vice versa and thus adjustments are needed to be done where necessary. With all alterations made, the concrete is able to be poured precisely as per drawing specifications. The depth of foundation varies from 9 feet to 18 feet and for most cases it is measured at 12 feet in depth. The foundation width is kept in equal to its depth. A slab is a structural element made of concrete which is used to create flat horizontal surfaces such as floors, roof decks and ceilings. A slab is generally several inches thick and supported by beams, columns, walls or the ground. If reinforcement is required, slabs can be pre-stressed or the concrete can be poured over rebar position within the formwork. By the month of February 2015, the project is progressing well and the development is now at 25% of completion. From this stage onwards, it can be roughly observed that the project is advancing at the rate of 5% of completion every month. One of many available concreting methods is by using a concrete pump. In most civil engineering projects, it is the most preferred method to deliver and pour concrete mix to a site. 
The concrete pump provides faster concrete placement, less labor intensive and is more efficient. Reinforced concrete buildings like in this project often have vertical plate-like walls called shear walls in addition to slabs, beams and columns. These walls generally start at foundation level and are continuous throughout the building height. Shear walls are usually built along both length and width of buildings. Shear walls are, in a sense, a vertically oriented wide beams that carry any lateral forces such as earthquake and wind forces downwards to the foundation. In reinforced concrete frame structures, the effects of wind forces increase in significance as the structure increases in height. Industrial codes of practice impose limits on horizontal movement or sway to protect the building's structural integrity and in turn preventing the building from collapsing. This test is performed to comply with the required load to withstand the weight and capacity of the structure. A precast concrete slab is a helpful addition to any construction project. The slabs are versatile, allowing them to be inserted in a variety of ways into structures and foundations. Concrete slabs are used in many construction projects, ranging from small home projects to larger commercial endeavors. Precast concrete has an advantage over traditionally made slabs because it is poured in a controlled environment. Precast concrete is also highly durable. It is resistant to many elements such as fire, water, damage and environmental rot and decay. In addition, the slabs are relatively unaffected by prolonged use or consistent wear. Precast slabs, in principle, are also much easier to maintain and care for as opposed to other materials. They are relatively non-porous, which needs very little maintenance and upkeep to hold their original form. This is an overall view of the construction site on March 2015. The project has progressed to 30% of completion. Another important element in construction is the cleaning works, particularly before a new batch of concrete mix is poured into the job site. The site is thoroughly cleaned to remove any loose concrete latents, an excess powdery substance of the previous concrete mix and other debris such as sawdust and timber chips. The task is performed periodically to ensure that only fresh concrete is placed in order to achieve the full concrete strength. This is the view of work done on Level 2, Podium Zone A. The workers are preparing beam and slab concrete moulding as per required in the building design. The building construction is progressing as planned. The project is estimated at 35% of completion. The same process of placing the precast concrete slabs is now repeated at Tower E. Whilst at level 4 of Tower 1 is undergoing the concreting process. Formwork beam is being built at level 4 of Tower 2. And at level 5 podium zone B, the workers are preparing concrete slabs. After concrete slabs installation, the workers cover the slabs with a concrete work to form a complete structure. The concreting is done at 75 mm thickness, which is a suitable height for semi-finishing work. At level 4 of tower 3 is going through concreting process. Formwork beam is being constructed at level 8 of Tower 3. This is an overall view of the project on May 2015. As of the date, the progress of the construction is remained as per schedule and it is at 40% of completion.
Scheme coat walls are one of the new approaches to smoothen rough walls. As seen here, the workers are using a tool called squeaky knives to give the wall a plaster-like appearance. Although it may seem micromanaging and highly red tapes, site visits are in actual fact a critical part of any project to ensure that the completion is on time and within budget. UTM management and administrator teams made regular visits to the project site, including the Honourable Vice-Chancellor himself. As of June 2015, the progress of the project is on schedule and it is at 45% completion. Brackets for cold water pipes is a part of installation work to be done, which is a part of building services requirements. A lintel is a structural horizontal block that spans the space or opening between two vertical supports. It can be a decorative architectural element or a combined ornamented structural item. It is often found over portals, doors and windows. Modern-day lintels are made using pre-stressed concrete and are also referred to as rips. These pre-stressed concrete lintels and blocks are components that are packed together and propped to form a suspended floor concrete slab. Lintels are required to carry gravity loads. For this project, all of the openings for windows and entryways are left during masonry works. As of July 2015, the progress of the project stays within the schedule and it is at 50% of completion. Two out of four main towers are constructed in exceptional progress rate. The footage is showing steel bars, a material that plays a crucial part in any kind of building. At the time of recording, approximately 6,300 tons of reinforcement bars and at least 35,000 cubic meters of concrete mix have been used for this construction. This is an example of the installation of fire sprinklers. The fire sprinkler system is a simple yet effective mechanism to combat small-scale fires in a building. In a case of fire, the heat will rise and swirl towards the highest point, commonly the ceiling, and usually where the fire sprinklers are situated. When the surrounding temperature reaches between 52 to 72 degrees Celsius, a restraining metal will melt triggering another set of metal arms that would burst out water that are already in the pipeline. The system is developed in such method that only sprinklers around the high heat area would be triggered. Other sprinklers will remain shut. Fire sprinkler system is globally recognized as the single most effective method for fighting small fires and to prevent the spread of fires in their early stage before more damage can be done. Internal skim finish or internal plastering is a plaster finish that can be applied directly to the underside of a first floor slab. Underneath a concrete staircase, a brick wall or directly onto concrete bulkheads. Perfect for concealing unsightly substrate, the finish can avoid the need for a suspended ceiling or a jib rock lining. Generally, plaster is a building material used for protective and or decorative coating of walls and ceilings as well as for moulding and casting decorative elements. 
However, internal plastering is also intended to improve the joints of brick walls and structural concrete joints. As of August 2015, the progress of the project is on schedule and is at 55% of completion. A concrete pump is a tool used for transferring freshly mixed liquid concrete to a specific location in a construction site where it is needed. When concrete is required, a mixing truck first mixes concrete within its rotating drum. Then the truck pours its liquid concrete into a hopper, which continues to churn the concrete to prevent it from solidifying. From there, the concrete pump extracts the liquid concrete out of the hopper through a valve system and auxiliary hoses onto the area where it needs to be laid down. Autoclaved aerated concrete, or commonly known as AAC block, is a precast building material that is light in weight, high in load bearing, high insulating and exceedingly durable. It is produced in a wide range of sizes and strength capacity. AAC block is three times lighter compared to common red bricks. AAC block is a unique and excellent type of building material due to its strong heat, fire and sound resistance. AAC block offers matchless workability, flexibility and durability. On September 2015, the construction has reached a remarkable 60% of completion in progress. As the building raised higher, more materials, whether structural or ornamental, are needed to be used or positioned in high places. As what can be seen in this footage, a series of blue safety nettings are installed to secure workers and building materials. This is essential, not just to protect the workers, but also to avoid possible injuries to the pedestrians below should there be any case of falling objects or debris. The nettings are also a requirement set by the Department of Occupational Safety and Health. As of October 2015, the project has reached the 65% completion milestone.
During the project, toolbox talks are held periodically throughout the construction time span. Seen here are the workers discussing to facilitate in meeting all conditions that have been required by the Department of Occupational Safety and Health. As of November 2015, the progress of the project is on schedule and it is at 70% of completion. The footage is another example where the workers are installing reinforced shear walls, which are vertical structures that functions to withhold lateral loads such as wind and seismic forces. On November 2015, the UTM residency project has reached the 75% completion mark. As of February 2016, the progress of this construction is now at 80% of completion. Electrical wiring essentially would require a special attention in every building project. It is directly related to the safety of the people, utilities and equipment. Ceilings must withstand the air humidity and, depending on the use of the building, be protected against penetration of moisture. Screed is a thin top layer material which is made of sand, cement and magnesite or calcium sulphide. Screed is typically poured in sight on top of the structural concrete to give a smooth and level floor on which to lay the chosen floor finish. The thickness of the screed allows it to take up normal variations in flatness and levelness of the base on which it is laid. On March 2016, the project has reached the 85% completion mark. The floors are being prepped for tile installation. Floor tiles come in a variety of sizes. For this UTM residency project, larger sized tiles were chosen as the time taken to install them could be minimized and would reduce the total project cost. The waterproofing coating works are still being done on the rooftop. The rooftop will be coated in multiple layers. This is essential in ensuring the roofs are perfectly water resistant. Apart from waterproofing, the coats are applied to protect the existing roof membrane from degrading due to prolonged sun exposure, which is particularly highly degrading in a tropical climate such as Malaysia. As of April 2016, the construction is progressing exceptionally well into 90% of completion. At this progress stage, most works are concentrated to internal structure and design works. As seen in this footage, the workers are laying bricks for the drainage system 
as part of the compliance to local authorities' requirements for sanitary and sewerage systems. More final exterior works are taking place. Seen here is the external aluminum screen being installed. As the building is nearing its completion, the UTM residency has started hiring management and administrative staff and employees. In the footage, they are being trained on fire prevention and extinguishing techniques as part of Occupational Safety and Health Initiative. As of June 2016, the progress of this construction has reached 95% of completion. It can be seen here that exterior walls have started to be painted. A handrail is a structure that is designed to be grasped by the hand to provide stability or support. Handrails are commonly used while ascending or descending stairways and escalators in order to prevent injurious falls. Handrails are typically supported by posts or mounted directly to walls. Handrails are also installed as part of building safety requirements. A manhole or alternatively referred to as utility hole or maintenance hole is an opening to a confined space such as a shaft, utility vault or large vessel. Manholes are often used as an access point for an underground public utility, allowing inspection, maintenance and system upgrades. The majority of underground services have manholes, particularly for water and sewerage services. Manholes are typically constructed on the exterior side of a building. At this stage, most exterior building construction have taken place and more interior design work is taking shape. Waterproofing and screening work on the rooftop are reaching the final phase. As part of the beautification works, planter boxes are installed throughout the building. Waterproofing coats including a layer of screed are applied at around and the bottom part of the boxes to prevent water leakage. At a later point, enriched soils will be placed in the planter boxes for the purpose of trees and or shrubs planting. On October 2016, the project is nearing to its completion. Pebble wash is chosen to bring an aesthetic natural look to the flooring. Road curbing are also being done during the stage. As a general rule, road curbs must be constructed at the height level of 100 mm from the road surface. A thorough check by the Occupational Safety and Health Committee or JKKP from the Department of Occupational Safety and Health is necessary before the building is certified to be safely occupied. The process is essential in ensuring the public safety and to protect the building owner from any possible lawsuits. Smoke spill fans are designed to control the movement of smoke during a fire and must strictly conform to industry safety standards and regulations. Among others, the fans must be capable of withstanding high temperatures for a specific period of time. Rigorous testing on the fans are done to ensure all is working well during an actual fire. In October 2016, the UTM residency is at the apex of its completion. As seen in the footage, the final touches on the children playground are being done. On December 2016, the project is at the final hurdle of the finishing line. Final interior design work, including minor ornamental and architectural touch-up works, are being done. This is the point where the testing and commissioning of all mechanical and electrical equipment are continuously performed. Final road works, including road widening, are being done to comply with the local government's requirements. The finishing progress on steel made covered walkway that links the new building to the current UTMKL as well as to Masjid UTMKL and the MJIIT building. And as the grand finishing touch, the work to imprint concrete at the main entrance is performed. The task is being done specifically to bring a high aesthetic texture and value to the entire project. Saya Muhammad Mukhlis. Saya pelajar University Technology Malaysia. Saya dah belajar dekat sini selama 2 tahun. Saya tinggal di bilik studio yang telah disediakan oleh pihak UTM di residensi UTM KL. Berdekatan dengan kampus UTMKL. 
Terima kasih saya ucapkan kepada pihak Universiti Teknologi Malaysia kerana telah memberikan banyak kemudahan kepada pelajar-pelajar seperti kami dan kami merasa amat selesa. Hai, saya Anis Iman, pelajar dari Universiti Teknologi Malaysia Kuala Lumpur. Saya belajar di sini hampir satu tahun. Dari residen ke kampus hanya mengambil masa lebih kurang 5 ke 10 minit sahaja. Jadi, saya tidak perlu mengambil pengangkutan awam. The revered UTM KL residency project is now completed and has been running ever smoothly since its official inception in June 2017. During the grand opening, the complex was formally named as Residency at UTM KL. Residency at UTM KL is now functioning as the epicenter of all activities, not only for the students and staff of UTM KL, but has rippled to everyone in the surrounding community such as Mindef, Hulapol, Jupan, Belda and TM Multimedia College. The Gurney Mall at Residency at UTMKL provides far-reaching offerings including exclusive hotel and lodgings, seminar and banquet halls, shopping and dining outlets as well as a bowling arena. The Residency at UTMKL proves that UTM is capable of building and managing mega projects by incorporating UTM's esteemed technical know-how, extensive professionalism and cherished tradition. The Board of Directors is looking forward to more and even bigger feats in the near future.